Protectionism is a misnomer. The only people protected by tariffs, quotas, and trade restrictions are those engaged in uneconomic and wasteful activity. Free trade is the only philosophy compatible with international peace and prosperity. Welcome to Keith Knight, Don't Tread on Anyone, and the Libertarian Institute. Today we'll be discussing the privatization of roads and highways by Walter Block. Mr. Block, where is the best to find your collection of work? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that question. Please say it again. Oh. Uh, Best place for to find all the articles you've written and all your books? Uh, WalterBlock.com. Terrific. Uh, Mr. Block, right now I see that roads are currently built by the state. If there is no state, therefore there won't be uh, any roads because the state wasn't there to build them. Where is the flaw in that logic? Ah, that's a good one. I'm not sure. Well... There is a flaw somewhere in there, but I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> there were roads built in the United States before the uh, advent of the government. Uh, so there's a fallacy in that sense. But on the other hand, most roads were built by government. Even the Roman government built the Roman roads. Uh, uh, England built roads under the government. Uh, however, there were private roads built even under the aegis of the government in the United States. Uh, they were called toll roads. They were private roads. Uh, it sort of reminds me of the BMT and the IRT in New York City, Borough Manhattan Transit Authority and Interborough Rapid Transit in, in New York City. These were private railroads or underground railroads. Um, uh, the IND came in later, and that was built by the government. But the first two, the IRT and the BMT, were private subways. And uh, they were going to raise their um, price from a nickel to a dime. And the government said, oh, this is horrible. We can't do this. We have to not nationalize, but municipalize. Namely, the city took over. And then guess what happened? They raised it to a quarter. But that's another minor detail. Well, just as there were private subways in New York City, there were private toll roads in the United States. Namely, uh, somebody, you, for example, Keith, you built a road from, I don't know, uh, A to B. And you charged a, a, a fee. And what you would do is you would charge uh, horses so much and a wagon with how many horses and how many axles. And you even charge based on the width of the wheel because a wide wheel would, uh, uh, I mean, these were all dirt roads. They would uh, sort of flatten out the road. Whereas a narrow wheel, think of an ice skate, it would put a rut in the road. So you would charge a lot more for a, a, a narrow wheel than a wide wheel. And then uh, what happened is that um, the government refused to um, uphold the law, namely uh, to compel people to pay a fee. I mean, look, uh, we, we probably had private shoe stores then, but if the government, but if you came into my shoe store and, and you walked out with the shoes and I called the cops and they wouldn't do anything to you, well, I'm not going to have much of a shoe store. Well, similarly, uh, I go to your road and I refuse to pay and, and the government won't stop me. Well, then you're not going to have much of a road and they wouldn't allow you to have cops to do it because, you know, you'd be in competition with the monopoly cops. So uh, the private roads failed. But to get back to your interesting sentence with which you started, yes, it's a fallacy because there were private roads not before the advent of government because government has always been around. I don't think we've ever had pure anarchy. Well, we have anarchy between countries in the sense that there's no world government. But uh, in any given country, there's always been government. So there's been no private roads without government overseeing it. But there have been private roads built by private people. So uh, that would be the fallacy in that. Let's say that I uh, kind of don't even care about principles. I just want things to be of high quality, and I want everyone, including the poor, to have access to these things. If those are my priorities, why should I consider privati uh, privatization of anything? Uh, we, you can use roads or any other example. Well, the, the general case for privatization is two. One is uh, deontology, and the other is um, pragmatism or utilitarianism. Deontology is, um, you know, rights that uh, if we have private things, then we control them. And if we have public things, then they compel us to pay for them through taxes. And suppose you never use the roads. Uh, you're a hermit. Well, you still have to pay for them uh, because you might buy some groceries. 
uh, have them delivered or something. I don't know. Um, so the um, that would be the deontological. The um, empirical or the pragmatic or the utilitarian case would be that the government does it much more expensively. So you might think, well, you know, they're freeways. They're, uh, you get it for free. <laughs> well, you don't really get it for free because you have to pay taxes for it. So, uh, and, and the amount of fees that you would pay would be less than the uh, taxes that you pay because government um, uh, charges more. Uh, we have um, almost controlled experiments in two areas where private and public both uh, coexist. And we can see that the private is a lot cheaper. For example, sanitation, garbage removal, uh, the empirical evidence shows that it's three to five times more expensive for the government to move a ton of garbage than private people. And similarly with the post office, it's much cheaper for the Pony Express or Wells Fargo or um, Purolator or somebody like that to move mail than for the U.S. post office. And um, the reason is they can't go broke if they do a bad job, whereas in the private sector, you don't do a good job. You lose profits. You have to go broke. You have to go do something else. And the people that remain are pretty efficient. Now, the, the key with roads is why did I write this book? My main motivation, uh, I had two motivations. My, my minor motivation was traffic congestion. My main motivation is do you know how many people die on the nation's roads? It's something oh, wow. like it's something uh, like yeah. uh, uh, I'm I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you cite okay. on page 349 in 1998 41,480. This is an uh, an open letter to Mothers Against Drunk Driving. But yeah, just to give people a number, that's actually that's what we're at. Yeah, 40,000. Sometimes it's 41,000. Sometimes 37,000, 38. Sometimes 42. Around 40,000 people die. To give you an idea of what 40,000 is, I mean, how many people died in 9/11? Only 3,000, and that was just one shot. This is 40,000 every year. How many people died in uh, the aftermath of Katrina, which really wasn't Katrina's fault. It was the fault of the Army Corps of Engineers who let their levees fall. 1,900 people died then. And, you know, everyone gets all excited when um, a cop kills a black person. Well, how many uh, uh, black people get killed by cops? It's uh, almost single digits per year. We're talking about 40,000 people, mothers, fathers, uh, men, women, whites, blacks, uh, orientals, whoever. Uh, it, it's just a massive, horrible thing. And people say, well, you know, it's inevitable death taxes and uh, motor vehicle accidents. And then they start saying, well, the reason for it is got nothing to do with government, God forbid. It's because of... Um, uh, drunk driving and uh, vehicle uh, malfunction and uh, texting and inattention and um, road rage. And, and they, the NHTSA, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, and I want a little applause for getting that right. It's, <laughs> it's a tongue twister. Thank you. Thank you. Um, they list 125 different reasons for why there's deaths, like very minuscule, like how far away is a hospital from the road? Or is there a regular ambulance or is there a helicopter ambulance? And this is relevant because you have a helicopter ambulance, you can get people to the hospital sooner and you save more lives. But these are all um, proximate causes. What do I mean by approximate cause? I'm now going to take a gun and I'm going to shoot the guy outside and you all grab me and say, I'm a murderer. I say, tut, 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 I'm not a murderer. Uh, I didn't kill anyone. It was the bullet that killed him. Yeah. I mean, you know, this is silly. Uh, yes, the, the bullet was the proximate cause, but the ultimate cause was, you know, me shooting him. So I'm a murderer. Or take a case of a restaurant going broke, and, and uh, the proximate causes are, well, they didn't hire a good chef, they located in a cul-de-sac where nobody goes, uh, they didn't um, uh, hire a good waitress, and, and no, they didn't give anyone a broom, the place was dirty. Those are just the proximate causes. The ultimate cause is the manager. The manager didn't hire a good chef, didn't hire a good waitress, didn't uh, locate the place well, didn't make the place clean. Well, now let's get to the analogy of roads. These um, 125 different causes, those are only proximate causes. What's the ultimate cause? The ultimate cause is government. Government is the manager of the roads. The government didn't stop drunken driving. The government didn't stop speeding. The government didn't stop this, that, and the other. So uh, the real reason why so many people are dying is because of the management and the, the government is managing the roads, so it's the government's fault. And if we had privatization, 
uh, we would have competition between your road and my road and, and Joe's road and Pete's road. And, and, you know, I would advertise, well, there were very few people on my road that died. And, and on, on Keith's road, people are dying like flies. So come to my road, not Keith's road. I mean, why do we have pretty good shirts and, and pretty good um, wristwatches? Because of competition. So I'm just trying to apply that to roads. So the first half of this book is, well, what could a private road owner do that would reduce deaths? And the second half of the book is, well, what are the objections? Well, one of the objections is a private road owner will trap you inside your house. He won't let you out on the road. And there, there are dozens of objections that people would raise. So that's pretty much a summary of the book. And the second motivation was a congestion. I mean, what, what city do you live in? I'm in Chandler, which is right next to Phoenix in Scottsdale, Arizona. Okay, well, Phoenix is a big city. I don't know what the traffic jams are like there, but in New Orleans and New York, where I'm familiar, in Chicago, traffic jams are horrible. There's traffic congestion. And, and this is a pain in the neck, and it leads to road rage, which leads to deaths. And, you know, if we had peak load pricing... And when you charge more when it, uh, during the rush hours, well, then you iron out the, uh, uh, the oscillations of, of traffic. And, and so that would be my second minor motivation for writing this book. And how do you think uh, they would uh, often, uh, c they'd be more likely to collect payment by like billboard advertising, by having like a tracker on your car to see when you're driving, how many miles. I hate that because that's a little Orwellian. But, I mean, I could see billboards and, you know, donated highways just like they have in Arizona. We have the 202 East, and as you're driving, uh, this billboard uh, or this road is sponsored by, you know, a local OBGYN or something. Um, that, how do you see uh, roads getting paid for in the absence of a state? Well, right now we do have some private roads which are free. Like you go to Walmart or Costco. And you get into a parking lot that's, uh, I don't know, a quarter of a mile square or maybe a mile square. I mean, they've got these gigantic parking lots. And in these parking lots, they've got roads. You know, you have to go from here to there. And um, uh, the car can't park here because you'll block traffic. So uh, when you have a Walmart and they want people to come there, they give free roads, just like they give free electricity. Uh, uh, namely, they don't specifically charge you for it. Uh, so that's one way. Another way is uh, uh, the Boy Scouts or, I don't know, the Kansas Society is sponsoring this road. Everyone gives to the Kansas Society or, or something like that. Uh, and third, when I started writing this book, uh, I forget when the book came out, 2009. Uh, well, no, you see, when I, uh, the book is a, a collection of many articles. And the first articles were written in the 70s. And what I was doing was I was going over grocery journals. And people were asking, what are you doing with grocery journals? Well, this is when the groceries were first uh, starting that thing with the universal product code on, on the oh, side, yes. of, uh, uh, side of, uh, I don't know, uh, breakfast cereal. And you go blip, blip, and, you know, th this is the beginning. So what I was saying is that every car could have un under its underbody um, uh, a code. And when you ride over uh, something, uh, you get a bill at the end of the month. And nowadays on some bridges, they don't have uh, toll collectors, you know, give them a dollar or give them five dollars. They just send you a bill at the end of the month and, or you mm -hmm. register your credit card. So uh, one of the objections uh, that I, I mentioned were objections. I mentioned um, uh, you'd have to stop in front of everyone's house and put in a nickel. And you know, that would slow down traffic. Well, you know, that's that's a silly objection because we have high tech. And even before the high tech, what you'd have would be, um, you know, I do um, marathon racing and 5K racing, and there'll be 20,000 people in the race. And everyone has to pay 50 bucks or whatever the amount is. Well, how do they keep people out? I mean, you know, you're a free rider. You, you don't want to pay and you want to run with us. They give you a little bib that you put on your chest with a, a safety pin. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have one, the cops will uh, put you in jail for theft of services. Well, yeah. we could do that, too. Uh, so, you know, one of the problems you mentioned, it's Orwellian. Well, you, you're out to see your proctologist or you're out to see your um, your um, what do you call it? Um, what's it when you I can't think of uh, your mistress and, and you're married. You don't want anyone <laughs> to know. Well. What you could do is, is get a, um, uh, you know, um, a yearly pass or something like that. So if you want privacy, you pay for privacy.
Uh, yeah. Privacy is not a right. And some people want privacy. They don't want anyone to know they're going to see their mistress or their proctologist or their psychiatrist or whatever it is. So uh, that would be one objection uh, that it would be Orwellian if, if everyone, you know, if the road knew where you were going. Yeah, uh, there are a lot of uh, criticisms of anything that we put forward in the free market. There's going to be greed. There's going to be corruption. There's going to be, you know, lack of caring. The problem with these is they all apply to government tenfold because you can't opt out of uh, funding government. Do you think there's any in all your decades of research, any criticism that uniquely applies to the free market? Well, yeah, uh, human imperfection. I mean, you know, uh, we have bankruptcy, right? I mean, you know, every once in a while a shirt manufacturer goes bankrupt or a bank goes bankrupt or because the human condition, I mean, we don't have perfection. Uh, there's such a thing in economics called perfect competition. It means something very different. But one criticism of the free enterprise system is that it's manned by human beings, flesh and blood creatures who are mistake making animals. Uh, so that's a criticism. I mean, I'm digging deep into the barrel here to come up yeah, with the but, but the reason is, is that politicians are also human and they're just as imperfect and they don't have an incentive to be better. And, and they don't automatically lose out. Now, there is such a thing called market failure. And what they have is externalities and public goods and monopoly and, and about 50,000 other things. But the Austrian economist rejects all such things, uh, market failures. Uh, the only legitimate market failure is that human beings are imperfect. And But as you say, uh, government, and, and I'm conceding that they're human beings in government, and uh, they're even more imperfect because they don't have this market process to save them. Excellent. A lot of people in a discussion when discussing which sort of system would be most moral and most beneficial to the widest number of people, improve quality over time, lower prices – it's at some point, it's almost inevitable someone will just come in and think they've won the argument by saying, I think it should all be free. And it's so difficult to get into that mindset. As an economist, how do you get into the mindset of someone who just says, oh, yeah, healthcare, computers, college, electricity, utilities, uh, th those should be free? Well, it'd be nice. I'm I'm in favor of that. <laughs> I'd like everything to be free. And and then I'd be out of a job because economics is the study of scarcity. And yeah. the reason we don't have everything for free is because uh, things are scarce. We want more than we have. Therefore, there's scarcity. And if there's scarcity, we have to figure out who gets it. Well, one way to figure out who gets it is, you know, uh, how much are you willing to pay for it? I mean, there are some things that are for free. Gravity is for free. You stay on the planet. You don't flow off. Uh, air on the, on this planet is for free. You can breathe all you want. I mentioned I do marathons sometimes. Well, at the end of the marathon, you know what I'm doing? I'm going like this. <laughs> I'm, I'm panting, yeah. trying to catch my breath. Nobody comes up to me and says, hey, Block, you know, you're a pig. You're, you're hogging up too much, uh, too much oxygen. Oxygen is free, thank God, here. The more things that are free, the better. If healthcare could be for free, fine. But but healthcare is very scarce, very limited, and so are shirts, and so is um, highways, and, and so is uh, economic goods. Now we go to the moon and Mars. You're going to have to bring your oxygen with you, and because oxygen won't be free here, so we should enjoy uh, freedom, <laughs> namely no prices. So I'm not against that. I favor it. It's just that uh, if everything were for free. You'd have more people that wanted any one thing than there was available. Now, how do you decide who gets it? Well, one way is you get online, uh, like they did in the old Soviet Union. You know, you have these long lines where people just wait for their food. Well, that's pretty inefficient. Or when you have price controls over gasoline, then you have 50 cars lining up uh, to buy a gallon of gas. So uh, it's not good that we make free things that are scarce because then we have uh, very less efficient ways of, of determining who gets what. Excellent point. Yeah, that they always say, well, it just needs more funding and it should be free, which is it, just as dumb as saying the military is free because it's paid for uh, through taxation. They never uh, even just assume that, well, maybe it's poor management. Maybe they get too much money and they need more economic discipline. Uh, they just come in here and say it's free and think they're adding something of value to the conversation. What well, is no, you know, it's possible that if the government put all of its tax money in healthcare, let's say, uh, 
and now we don't have any roads and we don't have any libraries, we don't have any schools, we don't have anything else, it's possible they could give it out for free, but at the cost of we'd have no food maybe. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? In other words, if we put all of our money in, into something, shirts, we could give shirts out for free if we put enough money in it, but then we'd have so many shirts, we'd be up to our armpits in shirts and we'd be lacking toothpaste and lacking um, God knows what else, cereal or shoes or, or something else. What is the importance of the entrepreneur in the economy? Well, let me uh, answer that with the case of roads. How might an entrepreneur make roads more safe? I'm an entrepreneur of roads, you're an entrepreneur of roads. How can we make it safer? Well, right now, um, uh, I guess the I-10 runs through Phoenix? Yes. The I-10 runs through New Orleans. It's a straight shot. I, I can drive, um, I mean, it'll be a long trip from New Orleans to Phoenix, but, you know, it's just one highway. And what are the rules of the road? The rules of the road there are 40 miles an hour minimum and 70 maximum. And that's the way not only I-10, but every uh, uh, U.S. highway is like that. Is that the best way? Is that the the way to uh, minimize that? If I were a road entrepreneur, maybe what I would do is I would say, well, in the right lane you have to do 55, in the left lane you have to do 70, and in the uh, in the middle lane you have to do 70, in the left lane you have to do 85. Would that be uh, would that save lives? And the answer is nobody knows because nobody's allowed to try anything else. Everybody has, ha, uh, all the roads have one rule of the road set up by Washington, D.C. Now, maybe on your road, you would say 60, 70, and 80. Then we would say, in other words, I, I, we're, we're not road entrepreneurs. There is no such thing as a road entrepreneur right now because there are no private roads. But if there were entrepreneurial roads, uh, we would have different um, speed limits. Maybe it would be minimum of 50 and maximum of 80. Well, maybe each lane would have a different speed limit. Uh, you know, right now you do 70 in the left lane and what happens? People start going around you because most people want to do 75, yeah, 77. Yeah. Now, maybe lane switching is is um, a bad thing and maybe lane switching keeps uh, uh, creates a lot of deaths. So on my road, I would, I would say, um, you know, if you pass on the right, we're going to kick your butt. Whereas now they have a rule, don't pass on the right, but they don't really enforce it. Another thing I would do if I were a road entrepreneur, you know, sometimes there are these trucks and, and, and say just two lanes going in one direction and, and truck A is trying to pass truck B and it takes five miles for them to pass them. So when you see two trucks, one right in front of the other, what I do, don't tell the cops, but what I do is I floor it and I try to get a pass them before the, the they can blockade you uh, behind them. So maybe <laughs> yeah. on my road, I would tell truck owners, look, uh, slower truck, don't let, you know, slow down two miles an hour. So let the guy pass you in a quarter of a mile instead of the 15 miles. And I'm going to give you a big ticket if you don't. Would this reduce deaths? Well, probably is. I'm doing 90 miles an hour to get past those stupid trucks. Maybe I wouldn't have to do that if I knew that the, it would only take a, a minute or two for the one truck to pass the other instead of 15 minutes. So these are the kinds of entrepreneur. I mean, you asked about entrepreneurship and what I'm trying to do is apply it to roads. And, and what I'm saying is that the road entrepreneurs would come up with all sorts of gizmos. Like another one, if there were a lot of deaths, what I would do is put up a Christian cross or a Jewish star or a Muslim, uh, whatever the Muslims do. I'm not talking about this high. I'm talking 50 feet high to scare people. Would that work? I don't know. But a road entrepreneur would experiment with these sorts of things. And then maybe we would reduce deaths instead of, and, and my estimate is that instead of 40,000, we'd have 10,000 deaths. I extrapolated from the difference in price between um, uh, garbage collection and, and uh, mail delivery. And, and the government is, uh, you know, five times more expensive or four times more expensive. So I figured to get rid of four fifths of the deaths. So I figured instead of 40,000, we'd have 10,000 or, or something like that, or 8,000. I forget the exact numbers. So that would be my answer to your question of how entrepreneurship could apply to roads. Very often in order to uh, justify socialism or any form of state, 
state intervention, people will point to a lack of equality. So let's forget about equality of uh, you know m monetary assets, but people will say, look at these, the workers have very little influence, and there's like a few hundred of these people. However, there's like you know one or two people on the board who make like 90% of the decisions. This is a terrible way to run an economy. Are there benefits to having such drastically uh, to, to having such drastic inequality with regard to influence. Absolutely. Look, you know, the conductor in the orchestra has a lot more influence than the piccolo player. <laughs> you got a lot more influence than the cellist. You need specialization in division of labor. Some people are good at ordering other people around in a positive way, like the orchestra, con orchestra conductor. The coach in basketball can sit down the star. If the star is missing uh, 10 shots in a row, he's going to say, you know, take a break, uh, instead of shooting three points, go in and try to get a layup or something. Uh, so there's nothing in principle wrong with some people having more, um, uh, I don't know, control or more entrepreneurial control. Um, you also have to ask yourself, how do people become owners of businesses in the first place, because at one time there were no firms. There were just individuals grabbing coconuts or uh, fish or whatever they were doing. How did the first guy arise where he hired someone else? Well, he had to save. Look, I, uh, we both catch fish and, and uh, you, you eat all your fish and, and I save some fish. And then I come to you and I say, hey, I'll give you a salary more in more fish than you can get yourself. How will I do it? Because we're going to cooperate, we'll work together, and, and there are economies of scale. Plus, I saved up a whole bunch of fish because maybe I was a better fisherman than you in the first place. Maybe I just consumed fewer of them. In any case, I have money, and I can now make you a, an offer you can't refuse, as the mafia would say. I'm kidding about that. And, and now I control you. I'm your employer. But how did I get to be your employer? by paying you more fish than you were able to fish on your own. So it's a voluntary action. I mean, the, the reason people go to work for Henry Ford is Henry Ford had a better idea or uh, 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 Rockefeller had a better idea on how to um, do oil, uh, refine oil. And he had some money saved up and, and he was able to pay people more in salary than they were able to get uh, as independent uh, um, um, entrepreneurs. So. You might say, well, now Henry Ford has a and, and Rockefeller have a lot of control and they have 5,000 employees and they have more control than all of them put together. Fine. How did they get that? They got that through a voluntary process. So nobody should complain about that because you agreed to it. Yeah, I, I brought this up to Noam Chomsky after he gave a speech in front of like, you know, there were probably 20,000 people at Arizona State. And he did 99% of the talking on the stage. So we're all we're all waiting in line, and I, t I take a picture. I said, "Thank you so much for your excellent work on foreign policy. It's really been motivating." Uh, was it unequal? Was there a radical inequality in the amount of time people got to speak tonight? 0.1% of people did 99% of the speaking. By the way, everyone was much happier because of that radical inequality. It's it's a good thing. And uh, he pretended like he didn't hear me and signed my book and uh, just kept going. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Uh, uh, I was supposed to have a debate with him and uh, we were going to have it set up. And then he uh, said, but he didn't want it taped. And, you know, <laughs> if it's not taped, just he and I can hear it. Now, I was honored that he was willing to debate me, but I, I wanted it taped so that other people could see it. And he refused to have it taped. And, and yet he's debated other people, so what do I know? Uh, but you're quite right. On foreign policy, he is really magnificent. And he's really good on personal liberties, like most lefty liberals. Mm -hmm. You know, legalize uh, anything between consenting adults. But on economics, it's, it's as if the... God left out an economic gene or, or something like that. Final question, Mr. Block. Thank you so much for your time. What is praxeology? Why is it important? Wow. I could take a half hour on that. <laughs> no uh, rush. So take your time. Question. Uh, praxeology is the essence of Austrian economics, and it's the Rothbardian, Misesian view, not the Hayekian view. Hayek rejected praxeology, as do an awful lot of people calling themselves uh, Austrians because they, they, they're they not uh, Rothbardian necessians. Uh, so this is, you know, in, in Yiddish kite, there's uh, kosher and then there's glot kosher. 
super kosher. Well, uh, praxeology is super Austrianism, whereas the Hayekian is, you know, kosher, but not really as uh, up to up to snuff. So what is praxeology? Is the way I understand praxeology is that you believe in a thing called a synthetic a priori statement. So what's a synthetic a priori statement? Well, there are two other kinds of statements. One is a, a tautology. Bachelors are unmarried men. Uh, necessarily true, but it doesn't say anything about the world. It just says how we're defining words. And then there are empirical statements. Uh, it's raining outside or it's sunny outside. Uh, these are um, refutable. These are, uh, you have to, uh, testable. You, you can refute them. You can test them. It's an empirical statement. They have something to say about the real world, but they're not necessarily true because sometimes it's raining and sometimes it's not raining. So what's a synthetic a priori, which is the core of praxeology? It's a statement that is necessarily absolutely true, undeniable, untestable, and yet says something about the real world. This is magnificent. This is Austrian economics. So let me give you an example or two. You bought that shirt for $12, let's say. How much did you value that shirt when you bought it? More than $12. Otherwise, you wouldn't have bought it. Now, maybe you don't really give a good goddamn about the shirt, but you felt sorry for the person who sold shirts. I don't know. I don't know your motivation. All I know, there was something about that shirt at $12 that you valued it more than the $12. And the guy who sold it to you, he had 50 of those shirts. He was dying to get rid of them. He probably valued it at a dollar. And he sold it to you for 12. He made a profit of 11. So what I'm saying is this is necessarily true that trade, you started off uh, this, um, uh, this program by saying that trade is mutually beneficial. Well, that's praxeology. You're a praxeologist. You see, this is absolutely true, undeniable, apodictic. You can't deny it. You can't test it. How would you test whether uh, a voluntary trade is mutually beneficial or not? It just is. And it's not just the tautology, uh, which says nothing about the real world. This says something about the real world. And then there are dozens of others about rent control, minimum wage, uh, free trade, and uh, a whole bunch of other praxeological statements. But uh, that's perhaps the, the best one. There, there's this guy, Brian Kaplan from um, Mason, who wrote a thing, Why I'm Not an Austrian Economist. I gave him this example. I said, well, you know, you bought those shoes for a hundred bucks. Uh, didn't you value the shoes more than a hundred? And he didn't agree with me. And he started talking and I couldn't understand him. Uh, so, uh, and I had a full head of hair then and look at me now. Uh, <laughs> so people who deny praxeology, well, there's good and sufficient reason to deny it because a lot of the mainstream economists think that it's cultish. Gary Becker, my dissertation advisor at Columbia and, um, um, Jim Buchanan, Nobel Prize winners both, thought Austrian economics is culted. Why? Not because we have different views on Austrian business cycle theory or different views on this or that, but because of the uh, praxeology part. That's why uh, they call this a cult. Well, uh, they're logical positivists. They believe that either uh, a sentence or a statement is a tautology, which is absolutely true, but says nothing about the real world, or says something about the real world, but is not necessarily true. And here we come along and we say there's something that absolutely true, undeniable, untestable, and says something about the world, we're a cult. Well, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> Mr. Block, yeah. thank you so much for your time. And uh, thanks to everyone else for watching Keith Knight, Don't Tread on Anyone, and the Libertarian Institute. Take care, Dr. Block. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I look forward to doing it again. It's always a pleasure.